For our first podcast of 2022, we're going to the source, the staff themselves, so you can hear them debrief last summer and their thoughts on recruiting future superstars at our camps. And I'm going to warn you now that Ashley Whittington and Justin Pritikin offer up some sobering realities alongside some great ideas. So buckle up, buttercup. This is the Day Camp Pod. Welcome back to the Day Camp Pod, a place for discussion, stories, and best practices for day camp pros across the world. I am Andy Pritikin, Director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake Park District, Crystal Lake, Illinois. And we are so lucky today. We have two guests that are not the typical uh, day camp pod guests. They are not day camp professionals by any means as far as year-round professionals just yet. They are seasonal professionals up to this point in their lives. And we brought them in to get the perspective of young people, because when you listen to a whole bunch of 30, 40, 50, 60 year old people talking about what they think about the experience for young people, that's one thing. But to actually hear it from the mouth of babes, that's what we're looking for. Maybe that's what we'll call the episode, Sam, from the mouth of babes. <laughs> so, um, so let's have them introduce themselves. Ladies first, Ashley Whitting Whittington. Um, why don't you tell us about yourself? Hello, my name is Ashley Whittington. As you just said, I am a freshman at University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, so I'm 18, and I have been involved with the Park District since I was four, gone to camp every summer, hired Ooh. as soon as it was legal in Illinois, and I've been working with the Park District ever since. Right, right. So, um, so what do you do what, what did you do last summer at, uh, at, at the Crystal Lake camp? And what are you gonna, what do you plan on doing this summer there? Last summer, I was a camp counselor for our Pee Wee campers. So those are the children going into kindergarten and first grade. My, I had about six kids in my group and this summer I plan on doing exactly the same. Oh, that's nice. So um, honest, honest question. Okay, I'm looking for an honest answer. How was your summer last summer? I think it was simultaneously the best summer and the most stressful summer of my life. Um, mm -hmm. like why, why was it so stressful? My kids and the, like the, just COVID kids, their behaviors and not knowing how to listen or interact with other kids. They haven't been around other kids and we could see firsthand when we normally would see like normal social cues and they just didn't pick up on it or they would just start hitting as a response mm. to something they didn't like and it was really stressful having to deal with that every single day and multiple times a day with the same kids who don't understand that they can't do that and they're just not listening yeah no it's, this is this is a crisis we have going on here and especially for little ones who never got to learn it there's no doubt about that um did you work in 2020 yes i did so how would you compare 2020 to 2021? At least in 2020, the kids, uh, or in 2020, I was working with older kids. So they, they knew their social, they knew what to do. I was working with the kids going into fourth and fifth grade and even sixth grade. So mm -hmm. they had already been socialized. And the one day that I subbed with the, with the littles, um, they, it, like one of my kids this summer didn't even know how to use scissors. He had never held scissors before because they didn't learn because he didn't go to preschool. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It was it was about like that even last summer. But this summer, something about it. It was it was worse yeah. than last summer. Yeah, no, there, was a, there was a lot about it. What, what about your own like mental headspace? Like, do you think that you were like, you know, wh where do you think you were at like mentally, you know, when the summer came? Uh, I think the first week and right around the middle of the summer, I was right along the rest of the counselors. We were really contemplating it, like even just quitting because we didn't know if we could do this. I would uh, one week when one of my campers was having bad day after bad day, you know, right up after right up. I would I would like cry before work and the night before, like, I don't know if I can do this again over and over again. It's the same thing. And it was really hard. My even coming home at night and I was or at 
3 34 and I was so exhausted I didn't even have the energy to have my summer some days you know yeah yeah so you had you had just come off of your senior year of high school which I'm guessing was mostly virtual right yes yes it was right and then next thing you know you're outside you know in the heat dealing with it right sam told me about those little bugs in the lake yeah. <laughs> swimmers <itch. laughs> yeah yeah um so you did you even get like a prom and a graduation or anything last um, year our our prom was on the tennis courts and it was socially distanced and our oh graduation gosh. was split right down the middle um so we had to pick a time slot and it was outside on the football field Wow. prom on the tennis courts <laughs> oh my god and for those of you that are not watching on youtube ashley was using her fingers to make parentheses saying prom because <laughs> <laughs> yeah were people in prom dresses on the tennis courts it was about half and half all right yeah, yeah some people i, I would have been in, in my sweats yeah <laughs> so you went from personal stress and things not being normal and not getting to hit those milestones that you always thought you were going to hit to write into dealing with all these kids who didn't get normal and didn't get preschool and didn't get, and, you know, don't understand the social stuff. Exactly. So, yeah. Right. Right. At the most crucial time to right when they need to be learning all of these things, they, they skipped right over it and they were just around their parents for years. Yeah. Right. So, so not to, not to condemn, you know, your, your camp by any means at all. I'm not looking for that, but like, what was it? Like, did you feel like you were getting support? from like your supervisors and stuff like that? Because I mean, to me, everybody was in such a tough mental state that most people felt like they weren't getting support. I was a camp director, I, didn't, I wasn't getting support. And then like the next level down, they didn't, you know what I mean? Like all the way down mm -hmm. to the front line, you know? And Sam and I have been talking all, you know, since the fall that that's our big commitment is to supporting our staff. So I'm just wondering how, what it felt like from a frontline person who was struggling every day like you know what what was the, what was it like with your supervisor as far as that i know that for me personally i i really lucked out with my director and assistant director they were there in a heartbeat like if anything went wrong they're there to help they're there to support they know just what to say and they're telling us how to how to help next time and what to say um but i know at least people that were friends with in other camps at, at the park district they didn't feel like they were getting enough support if they asked a question they weren't getting a clear answer um yeah. but it's Pee hit or miss yeah but peewee camp they were great we needed it and if i didn't have their support i don't think i would have made it through the summer oh, that's awesome all right that's great all right so um let's introduce our next guest his name is justin and he's got a similar last name as mine. So go ahead, take it away. Yeah, uh, my name is Justin Pritikin. I'm a senior at Villanova University. I study human organizational development. And uh, yeah, I've worked at camps for the last six years, including Sleepway and Day. And I've been going to camp since I was two. Um, and, and what did you do last summer, Justin? Why don't you tell everybody? Uh, last year, I ran the Camp Ironman, as I put it. I spent seven weeks in Texas working at an overnight camp, working with entering ninth grade boys in a shed-like cabin. And then I- In Texas, to, let's, let's reaffirm that, in Texas. Yes, in the, in the heat of Texas. And then I flew <laughs> back to uh, the lovely garden state of New Jersey, where I got to spend seven weeks outdoors with entering uh, 10th grade boys and girls. I led a group of 25 campers by myself. And then for the last week of camp, I got to work with a group of 24 uh, entering first grade boys with two 14 year old counselors. Oh, and then I started college a, a half day later. It was a hell of a time. So Justin, you had an easy summer, what you're trying to say. No, it was um. not. <laughs> Developmentally, that's all over the, you went from the oldest to the youngest to the, and that's crazy. And then your coworkers being young, yep. holy cow. Yep. Yeah, well, I think Justin was a victim of what a lot of people uh, experienced last summer was because of the staffing situations and because of just what was going on and the the inability to get like backup counselors and things like that at times. And, you know, our extra week at camp that that week that Justin worked with the seven year olds, 
Um, it, most of our college staff had already gone back to college. People were brought back early last year. My first week of uh, camp this year, uh, we had all of our teachers were kept in school an extra week farther than the initial um, schedule Ted said. Um, and then all the COVID stuff and on top of that, and then you end up having the Ashleys of Ju and Justins of the world and you know taking advantage of them and just pushing them to their limits. And, and that's, that's sort of what I see there. Um, so, so what was it like, Justin, for, for your, you're talking to the day camp people uh, right, right now. So give, give them a little insight of what it was like to work at a resident camp. Yeah, well, it, it's quite similar between the resident camp that I worked at and, and your day camp, Andy, in the sense that, you know, both were uh, running during a pandemic and both were running with the most kids they've ever had. However, both did not have the adequate amount of staff and the adequate amount of experienced staff to do so. The scaling didn't happen in a just way. And so people like myself and Ashley who have experience were stretched thin. And while everyone was adapting with a smile, we kind of looked at our situation and go, well, we have to go even more above and beyond in order to do what is just for these kids. Because as Ashley mentioned, these kids are challenging coming out of this pandemic. You know, in 2020, staff and children rejoiced at the, the fact that they were at camp. And in 2020, you had all the people whose internships and vacations got, you know, thrown aside by the pandemic. In 2021, all those people were gone and internships and vacations were back on. So that other class of people were uh, gone as well, which left, you know, very few experienced staff members to then lean upon when you were struggling, getting burdened with all the amount of work that you inevitably take on as a young camp professional wanting to, A, please your, you know, directors, B, you know, satisfy the kids' needs, and C, you know, have pride in what you're doing. And so it became a bit of this, uh, paradox vortex of sorts of just like pain and misery where I was pushing myself to these levels where you know at resident camp we're up at 6 30 and when you have ninth grade boys in a cabin you're going to bed closer to 1 a.m and then you're back at it the next day in that Texas heat and then at day camp when you're working with 24 to 26 entering 10th grade girls and boys who have just been pulled out of high school for two straight years and in high school that's where you really get mature right and maturity is built through interacting with older kids these nine, these 10th graders have the mentality of ninth, eighth graders, some of them, and they come with so many issues and their parents are so sick of listening to them and dealing with them. And they're going through this social media tailspin that, you know, affects them in such negative ways. And they show up as hot mess expresses. And I'm, I'm one person. I can't take care of 25, 26 kids like that. And it was really troublesome and really hard for me to do a good job at the bare minimum with them. And it's just, I was miserable throughout the entire summer because I was being pushed to such an extreme. And both of you um, think about quality of your performance. You know, it bothers, I know it bothers Ashley, I'm sure it bothers you if you're not able to do your best work. And um, so that probably made it even more stressful. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I, you could hear it in Justin's voice, and and I think you know it's interesting that we the, the two random counselors that we came up with here, um, one worked with the youngest kids and one worked with the oldest kids, and I think that they were, those were the kids that were affected most by the pandemic, um, you know, emotionally, psychologically, all that kind of thing. Um, um, but there's just just uh, as an aside, to just get a little less serious. I do want to quote something that Justin said during the summer. Um, after he had worked at sleepaway camp for a week or two, where he said something about the the amount of money he was making versus the amount of hours he was working compared to day camp. <laughs> so, wow. you know, sleepaway camp's a, a robbery scheme, but it's it's you know you gotta do what you gotta do to turn a profit in this industry. It's understandable if you're doing this for the money. I mean, you're you're absolutely gone in the head at that point. Yeah, yeah. I think at one point, like how many days straight had you at work before you had your first day off? Too many. Too many. <laughs> but the thing was, and you know, Ashley mentioned it where it was hard to even enjoy the summer where, you know, camp would end on a Liberty Lake sense, you know, Friday's over and you have Saturday and Sunday off. And I would black out from exhaustion. I'd get home at 445. I'd be asleep by five o'clock and I wouldn't wake up till like, you know, noon the next day just because of the miles it put on you. And, you know, it's it just, it was really hard regardless of which situation I was in. 
All right. So, be so before we, we talk about uh, the recruiting aspect of things, I just let me just throw the question out there to Ashley and then to Justin. Okay. So, here we go. It's summer 2022 now arising. Um, how do you suggest to uh, to day camp operators that we that we create a situation that avoids, you know, besides having the adequate number of staff and, and that kind of thing, right? Because I have to say, Justin, I, I do think that we had a decent amount of staff, and um, but I feel like even the more experienced staff that we had, that they came in, like Ashley said, like a hot mess themselves, and and that sort of you know compromised their abilities to perform to their highest levels just just to start with. I, I would I would push back on that actually because if you know having 24 to 26 entering 10th grade kids on that ratio is a good amount of staff I disagree and then comma to that there was a 72 hour stretch Andy where I went from running a color war team running this group at the same time a color war team with over 800 people to then going on an overnight in the middle of the Lehigh Valley woods with 40 entering 10th graders with only th uh, three other staff members total where a kid ended up having a seizure. We saw a bear. It was like the weekend from hell. I mean, kids had a great time. They learned a lot, <laughs> but just think about that stretch where like that is not a good staff to camper ratio in the grand scheme of things. And that is not a fully supported staff. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying, but that was an extreme situation. I'm talking about the typical staff of the normal age children at camp, I think a lot of the staff where the ratios even were good, they too also struggled is what I'm trying to say. Would you agree with that? I, I think there was a <laughs> pandemonium across the board. Uh, you know, a rising tide raises all boats, Andrew. All right. So, um, so, so then, so, so what would you suggest to these kind of camps that had these struggles with these staffs for next year? What would, what would you suggest like, you know, top of the list? you know, that they should be focusing on for next summer to help support their staff? I'm asking you first. Yeah, sure. Um, it, it's, 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 it's a really crappy answer, but it's more staff. Um, and you, you mentioned it as an aside where you're like, you know, you know, having more staff is a given and whatnot, but that's really what it is. Less of a workload. You know, you shouldn't want to show up to work going, oh my God, I have so much to do that today's going to be off, right? You want to show up positive. You want to, you know, be working in, of course, a trustworthy and a collaborative environment. But if you're not happy, you know, there's a problem. And I think a lot of the unhappiness that happened from especially veterans last year was they just didn't feel supported because they had too much to do. So taking it off their plates. And I think that a really negative impact of last year with the support thing is that every year you have that, you know, percentage of camp staff who say another year, another year, another year. I think last year was such a burnout and a, you know, just let's make it to the finish line kind of summer that those people are done. Like they're not saying another year, they're toast. And so to make sure that we can, you know, recapture that essence of, you know, yes, this is a really fun place to work in order to do so. People just need to have less on their plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and better ratios and all that kind of thing. No doubt about it. Um, Ashley, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, it's hard to disagree with that because I personally, our, our camp was fine with ratios in regards to our kids. They were what they were supposed to be. Um, so I can't put any input onto ratios, but our burnout came with uh, like keeping them busy and our normal schedule would be spend half the day at the beach, spend half the day at an elementary school with crafts. But now we're spending a whole day at the elementary school or a whole day at the woods where they, they don't want to be there. I had to sit here every single day from all of the kids. Why are we here again? Why are we doing the same thing again? We're, we're running out of things to do. And when they're bored and when they're not busy, they're destructive and they're hitting each other and they're going to find stuff to keep them busy. And that's where all of our destructive behaviors came from with the kids is when they got bored and they didn't want to do another craft and they didn't want to play at the same playground again. Because when we were at the park with so many things to do and the like Veterans Acres Park, which it, it has woods and a splash pad and this and that, they spent five hours at the park because there was a new park. They just want new experiences and new places. And when they're at the same place every single day, they were so bored of it. 
they they hated it so just our normal non-covid schedule is what worked and that's what all of us were like just wait for the day that we go back to that it's gonna be okay just find something to give them busy give tell them to find the tallest piece of grass in this area something something to keep their hands <laughs> off of each other yeah well i think that is our intention um is, is to go back to the the much more of a pre-covid schedule right sam right absolutely good news we'll be at the beaches again this year if the matrix are good so um, that'll break up the day a lot more for the campers and the staff but you know justin when you were talking about them being toast at the end of the summer um when i asked my staff back um three of the camps almost all the staff came back but the one where i'm sure a lot of those problems were nobody came back and so right there that was my indicator that I missed the ball somewhere with that director and assistant director or the combination of counselors because they're obviously didn't see the worth of being there. So, yeah, I think that camp directors really need to prepare for an exodus of returning staff of who worked last year and 2020 in particular, where, you know, it's nice to say you're going to work at camp this summer, but especially if people are saying maybe they're being really nice to you because they're really afraid to say goodbye and they don't want to ruin that relationship or they're just not you know mature enough to do so because the conversations and phone calls i've had with my my friends my my you know acquaintances at camps are just like yeah there's no way i can put my body my mind my soul through that even though that's not the experience that's going to happen but especially with you know omicron and who knows what's next you know, you can't guarantee that necessarily in a lot of places, especially on the East Coast where restrictions are a lot more tight. Uh, and so I think that this year more than ever, you really got to do a lot more outreach and have a lot more aggressive recruiting tactics if you're going to have a, you know, well-refined and mature you know, staff to go into the summer with. Yeah, well, I, I do have to echo what, what Sam said, that um, even though you think that there's a mass exodus, um, that most camps I'm talking to, there's the, the camp directors are very surprised by the amount of staff that are saying that they want to return. And even though last summer was very hard for everybody, um, most people are debriefing it that it was hard, but thank goodness they did have the opportunity to do it. And it sort of helped them slide back into the school year when they were, you know, doing face-to-face -face learning and stuff that they they hadn't done the year before. Uh, and, and also, you know, as hard as it was, and, and, you know, I mean, look, it was traumatic in many ways for many of us. The return rates of the children is just, un, it's astonishing you know, how, how the kids want to come back and the, the, the enrollments and the re-enrollments going on at camps is record high right now. So um, that is because of the hard work that people like you guys did. So we appreciate that. Um, all right. So before we get into the next thing, I just want to talk to you about our friends at Camp Tivities. Woohoo! Um, Ryan and friends out there in California have put together an amazing scheduling uh, program. Um, auto scheduling, camper scheduling, group scheduling, rainy day scheduling, so much for, um, you know, programming your camp is a lot. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of bandwidth. Um, and there's so many changes that can happen and such. Um, even though enrollment's doing great, you can sort of get cracking a little early this year, folks. But if you're looking for a better way to schedule this summer, um, give them a call. All right, or go to their uh, website, camptivities.com. They would love to show you the next big thing in camp. Um, you know, it, it, the more you can spend outside and less, you know, sitting around on your big spreadsheets and, and whatnot, the better. So uh, check out camptivities.com. All right. Going back to the youngins here. All right. So we got these camp directors and they're like, okay, so yeah, we need more. We agree with you, Justin. We agree with you, Ashley. We need more support. We need more staff. We need to widen the pool of applicants. We need to widen. We need to hire more people and we want to hire good people. Um, but the thing is, is that, you know, people like you two, you guys grew up at camp. You came through the system. You drank in the Kool-Aid. You're all about camp, right? If you, if Ashley decided, uh, you know, that her summer was so bad at Crystal Lake, she'd probably get a job at another camp because <laughs> she's just a camp person at this point. So um, we, we want to give some advice 
to the camp folks out there that are like, where do we even get started? Like, how do we frame this proposition of, of working so hard outside with the kids when people who have never done it before have no idea what it is? So would anybody like to take a first stab at this conversation and we could just keep it rolling from there? Yeah, I can, uh, I can start. I think if you're gonna do this effectively and efficiently, you have to do your research. And by that, I mean, I think the breeding ground for future interested high schools uh, and college, but college especially um, folks are freshmen and sophomores at universities that are virtual or have hybrid components to them. People who are getting gypped out of the experience that college typically provides. Um, Gen Zers, we love buying concert tickets. We love going to festivals. We like doing things. We live for that quote unquote experience. And people who have had, you know, their last couple of years of high school robbed and now aren't getting, you know, that college experience as well are primed to be candidates for those who want to make a positive impact on younger individuals, those who want to be outside and have a more interactive face-to-face -face summer, um, those who want to do something different than studying accounting while they're on a Zoom for two hours in their parents' house, right? And so I think, you know, yes, you can target early education majors like Ashley, but if you want to find folks who are in the business school or studying sciences like, like I do, you know, you have to really sell that experience, not as much of, hey, you're going to be doing this for the rest of your life. And finding people who are lacking it is crucial because those are the ones who are easier to flip than those who are, you know, going to classes, having those college parties still, and then going, oh, I'll go to my internship and move on from there in life. Well, I think most colleges are back face to face. So, so what aspects of the experience are we talking about, Justin? When it comes to camp? Yeah. Well, you know, impact's a key, is a buzzword. It's a real buzzword for Gen Z people. We love making We love making an impact. And so selling about how you can be this positive force in someone's life, because um, we've talked about how, you know, ultimately disturbed some of these kids have become from the pandemic and how you can be that ray of sunshine for them for those eight, nine weeks during the summer, but also how, you know, you're going to meet so many other people your age in such a fun, you know, college-like setting that it's just going to be really conducive to your social happiness as well. Uh, and I think that with that, you know, you want to really weed out people who would be interested or not by being upfront with your salary. You know, the first thing I look at when I'm applying for full-time jobs or even part-time jobs in college is how much money I'm going to make because it's not something I, you know, jump out of my seat to do every day, like working at a camp. And so, you know, if someone has an issue with the salary or, you know, you find folks from a particular area having issues with salary, move on from that zone in particular, because I think that I've had so many, you know, doing for you, Andy, interviewing people from certain schools or from, you know, certain backgrounds who are just like, oh no, the salary's the, the line for me. I can't do that. And I think that sometimes we get a little stubborn and go, well, they're close to us. We got to keep, we got to keep pushing it. What do you mean by that? They're close to us. We got to keep pushing it. <sighs> for instance, if you came to Villanova and was like, Hey, you know, Liberty Lake's 30 minutes away, right? It's, it's not going to happen because these are the kids who are working at Goldman Sachs going into their sophomore year of college, right? These are the kids who are, you know, keeping up with the Joneses in regards to what others are doing. And I am not a mockery, but I am not looked high upon for working at a summer camp all my years in college, right? And so to put time and effort into a university or a region that's just because it's close to camp is not going to bear as much as, you know, looking at you know, somewhere that maybe folks aren't that, you know, into getting right into the workplace. All right, let's, let's pause on that. Ashley, what, what are your thoughts on this? Justin is such a good, he, he has a way with words, you know, <laughs> so he, he puts everything so nicely. And I think that a lot of camps tend to get people that live in the area because summer camps are not known to pay very highly oh, you're not like the 30 minutes away, you're not going to get somebody who lives very far because at that point they're paying for gas, they're paying for the drive there and back. And so recruiting wise, it's, it's a good sell for people who live in the area, live nearby. And you can do that by even making a night, like 
getting somebody who who knows their way around Photoshop, who knows how to make a make something look pretty and nice advertisement. We have posters up by the beach that the park district owns, but you need to get into the high schools, get into, you know, start start planting your seeds. This is a great place to work. It is the experience. You're going to make lifelong friends. You're going to meet kids that are amazing. Um, and even our local college too. talk to the to the teacher. Hey, uh, I have connections. Do you think you could mention that we're hiring here? Do you think you could you think you could just tell your students, hey, you guys looking for something really cool? Because then those students are like, huh, I like this teacher. I trust this teacher. That sounds like a good idea. And I'm actually looking for a job right now. You know, mm -hmm. no, it's a great point about the high schools, too, actually, to get them while they're young. Um, I know there's a lot of um, day camps out there that actually like, oh, well, you know, we don't even hire high school kids. You know, we just want only 18 and overs because, you know, decision making and all that kind of thing. But, you know, it is easier in some ways to grab them while they're young because there's just less options for those people. And they and they're less they're less, less needy for a lot of money at that point in their lives also. Right. Um, no rent and all that. And when you were talking about the money earlier, I um, this year I'm actually going to get to give hopefully a three dollar raise to everybody. Shh, don't tell Ashley. per hour per hour per yeah. hour. But the reason I didn't tell ahead of time is I wanted people to sign their contracts, not for the money. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of waited to see, you know, who said they were coming back because now those that didn't say they were coming back when they hear there's a big raise. If they show up at my door now, I'm going to want to have a discussion yeah. about is that the only reason that you want to return? Because that's not really the reason I want you. <laughs> True. So anyway, I got it. So so Justin and Ashley, so, you know, Justin talked about like, well, you know, there's a lot of kids in college and they have big plans. They want to work in investment banks and all kind of stuff. Right. So whether you're at Rutgers or Villanova or Wisconsin or Indiana, I don't think that makes a difference. I mean, there's, you know, majors, there's, there's 70 different majors at your college, Ashley, probably that you could be, right? So um, I think, don't you think that camp offers leadership opportunities that are important at any, for, for any major that you're doing? I mean, of course, it helps give people the opportunity to work with kids and see, I've had some people say, I love kids, but I don't know if I want to be a parent now because I have this experience, <laughs> but I don't know if I want that every day or people saying, I think I want to change my major, just any leadership experience. And it helped like being able, you have to be stern with kids or else they're going to push you around. They're not going to respect you or listen to you if you don't set your boundaries with them. And then you realize, huh, that'll work in real life too. I need to set my boundaries with other people yeah. and then I can take charge and do the things that I need to do. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, it builds leadership skills. It, it definitely does. I mean, I have been born and raised in this E21 Michael Brandwine era uh, you know, not going to traditional school growing up and really only having camp as my outlet to grow as a, as a person, um, especially social skill wise. But it's not a good recruiting tool, I think, because it's hard to believe unless you've done it. You could say all you want, but camp has a perception of being wet, hot American summer to those people who never worked at camp. And so when you say you're going to become such a great leader, you know, it kind of falls on deaf ears. And then the other part is, and I, I've heard it on this podcast, but I've never been able to rebut it, is you, know, <laughs> you talk about putting camp on a resume. I'm applying to grad school and jobs right now. When I lose room because I have to put other things, camp gets cut because on an industry outside of you know recreation, it's not seen in the way that it's seen to camp folk. And I think that it's, it's a real lost cause to be going up to you know 20 year olds and saying, hey man, really you're gonna grow your leadership skills by working with this. Cause to them, they just don't see it that way. And until you go through it, you're not gonna see it either. Justin is actually applying to work at Lululemon so that he can get other things on his uh, on his, on his resume besides Look, camp. I also want that, <laughs> in, I want that store discount. Okay, let's make our priorities clear there. <laughs> so um, this is one of the 
only jobs where you're having to really think on your feet all the time. How do we express that, um, not only to recruit people, but those of you who have stuck with us, how do we explain how to explain what camp is to people on a resume or whatever, it, if it doesn't get cut? It actually has so many skills, but how do you translate it? How do we let people know what it is you guys went through? I mean, I think that no matter what you choose, all a lot of jobs are going to tend to blend together. I'm working with other people. I'm thinking on my feet. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And a lot of resumes just kind of start to like blend in regards to the service industry. You're working around other people. It's going to you're you're taking from what a lot of other people are already seeing on resumes, on job descriptions. So you're going off of your, what Justin said, your, your notion about what you already have about what's going on. So it's, it's hard, it's hard. I would also just like to rebut Justin's rebut in that um, if you go to an interview and that person that is interviewing you has ever worked at a camp, I think working at camp goes a heck of a long way. Because like you said, you know, most people haven't, gone to camp or worked at a camp. But if you have, you have tremendous insight into all those great things that Ashley just discussed, just uh, mentioned that are things that you gain. Yeah, I, I a million percent agree. And I hope you hit the lotto in your interview to get that kind of person. <laughs> but, you know, I've spent the last six years working at a camp. It is less than 10% of my resume for the very reasons I mentioned before. It's there because it's a part of me and it's something I take great pride in, but, you know, at, at some point. But going, Sam, based on the question you just asked, uh, I think in regards to recruiting staff uh, on like the, the other end of that is I think you got to embrace the digital way. It has to be videos. Um, enough descriptions on Indeed, Handshake, your website. There is something truly powerful about a good two to four minute video that really shows what a counselor's job is. You know, heroic shots of them working with the kids, lifting a camper up as they place the ball in the basketball hoop, right? Smiling while swimming because people see that and go, oh, that can be me, right? When you read that job description on Indeed and you guys play this card of we're going to make you great leaders, they go, oh, okay, you know? Because a big selling point of camp is what a fun experience it is, right? That's why we can get away with not making that much money, right? And so just you have to really highlight that. That is the most crucial thing. You know, I think a big thing when it comes to recruiting staff, especially college, is word of mouth. And I think camps should do a, a, a better job at um, rewarding staff members who bring their friends, especially when they turn out really good. I mean, you might give them like a hundred bucks if they bring someone, but if they end up being really good, you know, maybe an added bonus there. But I, I begged my best friend at college because uh, her lifeguarding business went under. I begged and begged her to come work at camp. And she was just like, no, like, I don't want to do this. And it wasn't until I made her watch uh, me eating a pie during a color war uh, Apache relay that she was like, oh, I, I get I get the gist of this now. Oh, so this is like actually fun. Oh, and the lifeguards get involved with this too. Oh, OK. Yeah. She applied. She ended up being a head lifeguard her second summer. And now she's working at a sleepaway camp and camps her passion. Right. So there's a way to get people in. But once they get in, they're in. But we really got to do a better job of getting them in. And I think digital media is the, the way to go in a lot of ways. I love that. I'm going to ask. Ashley, I'm asking for your help this summer. And you know, all those things we take um, for granted, those moments that are camp, we got to capture them, you're right, and then put it all together. Sam, so. I guarantee you, ask the directors. We, we have the photos, we have the videos. Our rule was you can take a photo, take a video, send it to the camp phone. It'll go to a parent, it'll go to this or that. And like when we were in Pee Wee camp, when I was in camp and they had the dispos disposable cameras, we would get those photos at the end of the summer of us having fun. And I got to do that for my campers this summer. So put them out there. Awesome. Put them out yeah. there. I got to put that together for sure. I like that idea a lot. Yeah. I mean, what Justin's describing, I mean, this is the Instagram TikTok generation here. This is how their brains are wired, right? This is how they receive information. 
right? Am, am I am I saying that right, Justin? I mean, I think that's right. Well, yeah, and let me let me bash my own generation here for a second. This is the TikTok Instagram generation that loves posting about themselves, right? Oh my God, our poor photographer at Liberty Lake, his name's Frank, he's a saint, he's a, just an American hero. He takes great <laughs> photos, but he is under constant pressure by 18, 19, 20, or I've been a victim of this as well. I'm like, <laughs> let's get these photos on the internet so I can post them, right? Because people want to really showcase what they're doing in life. And camp is a really you know, different thing in regards to the beach photos that are constantly popping up on people's feeds. And they want to go, oh, look at me, I'm working with kids this summer, because this is that culture that we live in, that look at me kind of uh, mentality that we have as you know, Gen Z. Uh, kids. And so I think that, you know, really showcasing that and, you know, being, you know, gathering a couple photos of really awesome college students working with kids and going like, this is what your summer could be, right? That's a great advertisement. The videos, the even TikToks, right? Don't make weird, cringy TikToks. No one wants that, right? But if you make really, you know, I guess the best term to describe it is cinematic, right? Or a heartfelt ones, that captivates an audience. You know, I, I work a busy life at Villanova. I study a lot of things. I do a lot of extracurriculars. I still find time for an hour of TikTok a day, right? And it will <laughs> it will make its way to the people who who need to see it eventually. An hour, my gosh. So um <laughs> yeah, yeah, just to exemplify what Justin was saying, I think it was the last day of camp and Frank wasn't there. And Justin was like, Dad, meet me at the pirate ship at two o'clock. There's going to be 20 kids with eye patches. They're going to be super cute. And we're going to be doing this and it's going to be amazing. Get there. He was like directing. <laughs> Look, I, I became the group leader and camp photographer in that moment. I knew we had, uh, we made a lot of parents happy. It was, it was a very adorable uh, pirate party that was going underway. It was super cute. I do have to, they even, they even slayed a dragon. It was super cute. And, you know, we do survive on referrals on friends of, you know, once we get good staff and they bring their friends in and you always have to warn them not to bring their drinking buddies, but to bring their friends that will make them show up as, you know, being good. Um, and if they stay that that's a hard part for me, I'm a park district, so no, no money there. So for paying for referrals has never been an option. So I'll try to think of creative ways to make it worth their while for bringing in their good friends, other than them having their group of friends right there at camp with them. So extra staff shirts. Yeah, I know. That's what I was going to say, too. More staff shirts. Did you like the one you got in your care package? Yeah, you should do what uh, our director did, where she did the reverse tie dye and then tie dyed those. We want cool camp shirts, really like nice. They're yeah. the sweatshirts for cold days. Yeah. yeah. Ashley hit that on the money. Camp's got to do a good job at making cool merch. I, yeah. I worked at Sleepaway Camp that had over, I would say, 40 different apparel items, like different designs. And it was, it was great. I wear that stuff all the time at college. It works. Mm -hmm. And then they see that and you're at the store because you're like, okay, this is a fine shirt. I'll go out in public in this. And then they, somebody sees it and then they go up and ask you a question. I've had people ask me questions before if they see me in a, in a staff shirt, gets nice. people in the door. Interesting. All right. So really quick guys. So if camps were looking at a college, right. And they're thinking low hanging fruit, like where's the first place I should be looking for staff besides of course, education majors. Okay. I mean, think about clubs, right. Think about, you know, that kind of thing. Like where would you suggest that they be knocking on doors at? You hit that right on the head, Andy. It's student organizations that are rooted in service, right? That's the key word, service, um, where there are so many after-school programs, at least at the school that I go to, that work with tutoring, playing with young kids in the Philly area, and that is, like, perfect. You know, anyone that's giving up their time to work with others um, is the type of person who is going to thrive in a camp setting and environment and really, you know, get down to work when it, it need when the time comes. Um, but additionally with that, any other organization that, um, is very outdoorsy, right? The outdoors club, the rock climbing club, these are where you can find some really awesome specialist or activity leaders, whatever your camp calls, where, you know, you get the kid who is the vice president of the rock climbing club, and now you give him that rock wall to be the instructor of, right? Capitalizing on people's passions that are already in the same areas. The best thing to do to get that 
you know, business major or STEM person applying to med school is to be like, man, wouldn't you love to spend the summer doing what you love most, X, Y, Z outdoors or sports activity before you go into the, the dreary misery pit that is med school or, you know, the nine to five, you know, working day on Wall Street. Um, and so I think that's a, a really key ground that not a lot of people uh, capitalize on enough. Yeah, I mean, Justin does a lot of stuff at uh, college with the Special Olympics. And um, and would you think that like those kind of people would be good candidates potentially? I mean, they like helping people. They're working with with a lot of younger people. Yeah, I think it really helps to have an understanding of the institution that you are going to uh, be trying to attempt to pull people from in the sense that at Villanova, it's really unique where Special Olympics is the largest club on campus. It runs the largest event for the university throughout its entire year. So it has the most students involved, right? I wouldn't go, oh, let's go for the Special Olympics program because there's 4,000 of the 6,000 people there. And I don't think all of them would be so like-minded to want to then take their talents to a summer camp, right? So really, you know, when you make an approach, make a real educated, you know, move towards a college. Don't just, you know, shoot your shot and hope that something comes back. You got to be strategic. You got to be targeted with this where reach out to the office of student involvement at that place. Find out, you know, what these uh, individuals who are in these programs are most often doing outside of them or, you know, what's the makeup of these, you know, organizations. Because I think that, especially when it comes to finding diversity with staff, if you go up the same certain avenues that camps have traditionally gone, especially with early education, you know, it, it's not going to yield you a, a very eclectic group of people. Yeah, that's a great point, Justin. Um, I was having this conversation with a college student yesterday. I was asking her a question about that as far as diversity goes. And she had suggested that there's always a multicultural club at, uh, at colleges and that these are tend to be the kind of uh, like-minded people that might be into it. Not even just that. I think every, every college that I've had the opportunity to work with in the past year has a DE&I program, task force, or something built in that is student run through their student government association. And personally, I hate having to go through the bureaucracy that a lot of uh, higher education professional professionals provide when working with them. And if you can just tap in right to the source of a college student, and if that means having one of your college student staff reach out to a, you know, a fellow college student at a different school going, hey, can you put me in touch with this person? I'd really love to talk to them about you know, promoting you know, what we're doing because we have so many ideas and we'd love to get you know, some of your students involved with it. I think that is, that is the way to people's heart because I am bombarded with emails from higher education faculty of like, hey, look at this job, look at this and I don't open them, and I'm looking for jobs, right? It's when someone goes, hey, I think you'd be really good for this, whether it's a professor, whether it's a friend who saw something um, or heard of something that, you know, gets more of a response rate. Make it personal. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, well, referrals, Make it personal. Not, not, not spam, mm -hmm. right? What are your thoughts, on, Ashley, on low-hanging fruit at a college? I mean, well, it's... You already have the people that went to camp who want to do it. And like Justin said, you're going to the student organizations, pick your student organizations well. And I do like the idea of going to the multicultural organization just because at our camp, we know that we need it to the two pe people of color at our camp, all of the kids like gravitated towards them. They didn't leave their side, follow them around, or even men. Like they kids, they they're around women so much because a lot of camp counselors are girls. They just like men, boys. They like, like being yeah. around them. And I I don't know how else to put it. So <laughs> Especially with your age group, it's hard to get the guys who will work with the youngest ones, but the youngest ones really need the guys too. They really appreciate having the mail counselors. Uh, those are great points. Great points. All right, I'm going to do a quick little uh, tell about my uh, my friends at CRS, and then I'm going to come back and ask you guys, all right, this is a little bit of a surprise, all right, Ashley and Justin, to give one little activity you did with your kids this summer that was just awesome. That was a great thing that you can recommend, Ashley for the young kids, Justin for the older kids. All right, so my friends at CRS, 
um, commercial recreation specialists. They are the fine purveyors of the best recreation solutions to keep camp going strong. They make all kinds of water equipment, like the Wibbits. And well, they don't actually make anything. Here's a secret about CRS. They are middlemen. They find all the best stuff and then bring them to camps. So that's actually part of, the, of their magic is they're sort of like camp consultants for purchasing, right? For stuff like waterfront activities, for splash pads, for even pools, for playgrounds, um, for, for athletic stuff. Um, they have this uh, Recrosol stuff that's, um, that uh, is a disinfectant kind of thing. Um, you will see them at all of the um, camp conferences because now we're going back to face-to-face -face camp conferences. Okay, hopefully I'll, I'll be in Portland next month and then at Atlantic City a month later. Um, Check out my friends at CRS Recreation Pro. Uh, they, they got the lightning detector. They've got uh, sound systems. They got all kinds of really cool stuff. Rich and friends are killer. They're great. CRS4Rec.com. CRS is serious about fun. All right, Ash, we're going to go to you first. I'm talking to little kids. All right, so you have 10, 15 minutes with these kids, okay? It's one of those, come on, you need to do something. These are all new kids. They've never done it before with you. What are you going to pull out of your bag of tricks? Okay. So with little kids, it's, it's keep it simple. If you're trying to do something with setup, their, their attention spans already gone. They, they don't want to do it by the time you're setting it up. You need to have, have that ahead of time. You, you find toys. That's it. You need race cars or dolls or they'll play with any of it, but or you can help get them involved in obstacle course. That was always a favorite. You grab hula hoops, you grab cones, and you say, guys, we're gonna make the best obstacle course ever. And then I'm gonna time you because kids, something about being timed, they'll go for it every time. You say, I'll time you and see how fast it takes you to run to the door. I'll time you and see who can get back to our table first and drink the biggest sip of water. <laughs> so find something to time them at or find something that they can help you make because they like feeling like they're older and like they're adults, even though they're definitely not. They like to be able to, to help with something. Ashley, you are a true Sam Thompson disciple. <laughs> I, I, you, you, seriously, you have, you, have, you have put forth the spirit of Sam. <laughs> that is really, really awesome. A timed obstacle course using anything. You got laying around basically. String. They can jump over the string. <laughs> string is great. You should always keep string in your backpack with little kids, no doubt. All right, Justin, what you got? Well, it's hard. Um, I I spend my time running leadership workshops at camp. So everything that I do has, you know, a you know, you set it up, you do it, and then you debrief it. And so in regards to that with older kids, um, my my favorite, I look forward to it every year, is it's a game called Witches. Um, how it works is you give everyone a, and this is a prepared one, then I'll give you a quick one on the fly. You give everyone a note card that has a townsperson's job and description of what they can and cannot do. And you tell the, the crowd of kids that, you know, we gave out three note cards that are witches, right? And the goal is you're all going to mingle for, you know, the rest of the period and try to find out who the witch is, right? So some students are the mayor, some are the sheriff, some are, you know, the, the weavers, the well, who met whatever jobs from medieval times, right? And they spend the entire time trying to figure out who the witch is. And then they, they all huddle up at the end and we go, all right, nominate your three witches. And what ends up happening is it's the loudest voices that pick the three witches and we, we burn them at the stake. And then we tell them that we have them reveal what they are. And truly no one was a witch. And the lesson <laughs> is that, you know, sometimes adults are wrong and you shouldn't really listen to them and you should maybe, you know, second guess stuff and you should be more trustworthy of others, but also, you know, especially with 15 year olds, you know, there are those, uh, it tends to be the people that get burned at the stake are the really quiet kid and the mean girl who no one really likes. I'm like, ah, let's burn her. She's a witch. Uh, and so it's a good lesson in being like, you know what, maybe slow down a bit and maybe you don't have to burn a witch, you know, maybe break the mold when you're caught into a double bind. Um, so I really enjoy that one. But as a like quick game with older kids, uh, one of my favorites is running charades. It's really easy. Uh, you split them up into two, three, four, five teams. You have a list of 10 things. They're all lined up um, by their team separated. They run to the person who's giving them the clue. 
you know, I always try to make it fun. One of my favorite clues to give is Grand Canyon. I have a kid act that out. That's always really funny to watch. Um, they act it out. Then they run back, and it's just a fast-moving charade once they move through the list, and they're all sitting down. A team wins. That's really quick to do, especially with, like, fifth grade up. Kids get into that. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I really appreciate you guys' time today. Uh, thanks for hitting us up. Justin, I know this was the last day of your uh, winter break, right? Officially. Uh, you know, don't you go back on Monday? And Ashley, I'm sure you go back soon. Um, to nice and warm Wisconsin, right? Oh, don't mention it. Don't mention it. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank the Go Camp Pro Team, Commercial Recreation Specialists and Camp Activities for bringing us, bringing you guys this podcast, uh, helping pay for it. So if you like what you hear, you should subscribe to the Day Camp Pod on your favorite podcast platform. Check out the show notes for this and other episodes at daycamppodcast.com, as well as contact info for the show, our guests, and my wonderful co-host, Sam and Tiff. So listen uh, to the next one. It'll be coming in a couple of weeks. We'll be back. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, sorry your school breaks over, guys. And thank you so much for all the info and the honesty. We really appreciate it. Uh, and hopefully next summer will be an easier one for you. We, I, I, I promise you that for Sam and myself and for the vast majority of the camp professionals out there, we are committed to making 2022 a much better summer for our staff. So take care, everybody. <laughs>